Well, good evening, everyone. This is Mel and Murad uh, with you this evening. How's it going, Murad, there? Hello, Mel. It's great to be here once again. And uh, I think you're, you've made yourself a nice cup of tea. No, this is uh, Nescafe. Nescafe. <laughs> Actually, going to be, you're going to be wired for the night now. You won't get a wink of sleep. Um, it's great to see everyone there, Veronica and XYZ and Bob Fisher and Veronica and how, who else? Have I, have I missed anyone? Um, and SGX, Naboy, Café Linda, Oi uh, Mishnamez, and who else? Uh, someone else I think I saw earlier on. I can't. And uh, Kakar as well. I think I got everyone. If I've missed you, apologies. Okay, so um, the Ottomans, a scary subject, I thought, for Halloween night, or not quite Halloween. I think it's tomorrow night, isn't it? That's Halloween night. But um, to get us started, um, I'm going to show some quotations from a book that I read a couple of years ago, which can give you an idea of what the Ottomans were like. Um, and then we're going to um, play a video and uh we're going to do a kind of like response to the video um so hello to captain hood hood sorry i missed you and murat taniel as well so hello to all of you okay so let's um let's uh share this document no Okay, so this is from a book called The History of Greece under Ottoman and Venetian Domination by George Finlay. Um, I believe it was written in the 19th century. And uh, just one example of what went on during the Ottoman times. Uh, Muhammad II imposed the tribute of Christian children on Greece as it then existed in the other Christian provinces of his empire. A fifth of their male children were exacted from the Sultan's Christian subjects as a part of that tribute which the Quran declared was the lawful price of toleration to those who refused to embrace Islam. Parents gave their sons to be Jan Janissaries and their daughters to be concubines for the Sultan's harem. Any thoughts on that, Murad? Um, not really. Uh, we can just continue because uh, later I will tell you where all of this came from. Okay. Um, now there's uh, another little quote here which I thought it was worth sharing um, about the year 1329 Christian orphans whose parents had been slain were collected together and schools for educating young slaves in the Surrey, their palaces were formed this was the commencement of a systematic education of Christian children and of the, the corp of Janissaries Murad the first ooh, boo hiss uh, <laughs> gave both measures that degree of systematic regularity by which the tribute of Christian children afforded a permanent supply of recruits to the Sultan's army and to the official administration. So it was quite a brutal thing to do to, you know, to take children away from their, from their parents and from their family. Let me just uh, read from this book here as well. Officer, officers of the Sultan visited the districts on which it was imposed every fourth year for the purpose of collecting 20% of the male ch children who had attained their requisite age. All the Greeks of the village between the ages of six and nine were gathered and the healthiest, strongest, and most intelligent of the number were torn from their parents to be educated as the slaves of the port, all done to their parents' heartbreak and agony. And pre presumably those kids would never see their parents again. Um, I'm sure they probably attempted to find them again, but um, within a few years of being taken away, they would have been brainwashed, they would have been converted to Islam, and their morals completely changed by the system. Um, it says here that uh, at the accession of Muhammad III in 1598, there were 100,000 jan Janissaries, Gives you an idea, you know, if, if they're doing this every year and in one particular year, there's a total of 100,000, that would suggest that over the space of a few centuries, we're talking in the millions here. Um, there were also, it wasn't just Gre Greece where this was going on, it was in, obviously in the Ottoman Empire, so there was a number of countries where children were being taken away. 
There were also um, random raids on other countries, even as far afield as Ireland. There were there, there were stories of uh, women being taken from the shores of Southern Ireland, never to be seen again and taken to the harems. So there was a lot of brutal things. Later, the tribute, children were no longer placed in its ranks, nor was the tribute itself exacted from the former strictness, for the Christian population began to be regarded as more useful to the state as taxpayers than as breeders of slaves. So gradually, uh, things improved somewhat. Um, during the reign of Muhammad IV, uh, 1649 to 1687, the tribute of Christian children ceased to be exacted. Um, just take another uh, quote here. The sultans of Constantinople held millions of Christian landed proprietors and small farmers in submissive bondage to a comparatively small number of Mohammedans in the European provinces of their empire. So basically they reduced much of Eastern Europe to a form of slavery, bonded slavery. Um, in addition to that, there was a lot of corruption. The manner in which justice was dispensed to the subjects of the Sultan, whether Muslim or Christian, was so radically vicious as to render all decisions liable to the suspicion and imputation of corruption. The con consequence was that corruption pervaded the whole frame of society. There was a universal feeling of insecurity and a conviction that candor and, and publicity were both attended with individual danger. The want of morality and self-reliance which is made the reproach of the subjects of the Ottoman Empire can easily be traced to this defect in their social position. Mohammedans in Europe always contemplated the probability of their being one day expelled from countries where they appeared as foreign colonials. Um, hence resulted the nervous anxiety displayed by the Muslim mans or Muslims to convert the Christian population of the Sultan's dominions. Until the Mohammedan religion was embraced by all the Sultan's subjects, the government could neither be secure nor equitable. Um, do you want to comment on any of that, uh, Murad, at this stage? I just wanted to add that um, about the slaves from Ireland, they used to take the women and uh, sell them to the harem, and the, there was a certain pricing. So uh, a black woman uh, would be much cheaper as a slave than a white woman. Yeah. So you see, they, they always had this white supremacy in their head. Yeah. They liked the Irish because they were white and beautiful, so they sold them much uh expensive yeah so this is it's, very important to know yeah it's um and it's like you know they were somewhat... very uh, even even in uh <laughs> in taking slaves they were very racist yeah and actually you know when i heard um someone mentioned uh during the famine um that the sultan sent a thousand uh pounds to ireland to help with the famine relief my blood boiled, I'll be honest with you. Because, first of all, it, we're talking about one of the richest people in the world, and it was such a token amount, it did no good. And uh, I think it was um, a Taoist that was on the channel there a few nights ago um, with this, and, and thought I should be very grateful for this kindly deed. But um, to be honest, that's more an insult than, uh, than a help. And uh, I feel that... No amount of money would ever repay Ireland for people being kidnapped and turned into um, prostitutes, essentially, for the rest of their life, uh, with no hope of being rescued. It's just absolutely horrific. Um, so, yeah, that's the bit that I, I, I have no time for false charity like that. But um, Yeah, and um, remember that the Ottomans, they came after the Crusades, so they were very... Um, cruel and harsh and they wanted to to do the most cruel things ever to so exact, that they exact won't revenge. start another crusade. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and we so rarely hear about their actions. Like we we always hear about the crusades and how bad they were supposed to be. But we never hear about what happened afterwards. And I think if you think of the the long duration of the Ottoman Empire and what was done through centuries. I think there's no comparison. I think the Ottomans were way worse 
than anything that the uh, Crusaders did. Um, I think the Crusaders started off uh, with a virtuous intention. I think corruption crept into it and there was a lot of bad things done in the name of the Crusaders as well um, and things went off the rails. But um, in comparison to what the Ottomans did, I think there's no there's no comparison. Yes, even today, <clears throat> they they show you in America the the transatlantic slave trade and all this stuff, but they never ever mention the Islamic slave trade, which was much more horrible and much more harsh. And I think there is a woman called Sarah Foster. She did a great series with uh, Jay Smith before. And she really, like, uh, uncovers and exposes all of this. Yeah. So, uh, and and if you watch the BBC, especially when I watch it in Arabic, it shows you the, the Turks and the Ottomans as if they were great people of knowledge and and why don't we go back to these times. And, and this is, of course, horrible. But yeah, it's yeah. because there is politics involved, you see? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, th the Mohammedans were exempt from many burdens which fell heavy on the Jews and Christians. Infidels had to pay the capitation tax. This tax was levied on the whole male unbelieving population. In the reign of Suleiman, the legislator, the, this tax yielded a revenue of 17 millions of piastres, or piastres, whichever way you pronounce it, while the whole revenue of the empire only amounted to 27. So this uh, equates to 62% of all tax re revenue was uh, from the jizya tax, essentially. Um, and on top of that, import or export duty was double for Christians and Jews. So there was widespread um, discrimination um, in terms of tax. And um, now there was also um, genocide considered. The extermination of the whole Orthodox population was considered by the Sultan. But the tribute of Christian children and the revenues raised uh, or paid by the Christian population would have been destroyed. Salman I was eager to compel all his subjects to adopt the faith of Orthodox Muslims. He commenced his project of pushing an end to all religious differences in his dominions by exterminating heresy among the Mohammedans. About 40,000 Shias were massacred by his orders in the year 1514. Um, oops, let me just go back a bit. To complete his project for establishing unity of faith in his empire, uh, Selim at last issued orders to his grand vizier to exterminate the whole Christian population of his dominions and to destroy all Christian churches. So this is what's equivalent of what um, the, the Nazis decided in the 1940s with the final solution. So essentially, he'd come to the decision that that's what they were going to do. Orthodox and Catholics, Greeks and Armenians were alike condemned to death. With great difficulty, the Grand Vizier, Piri Pasha, and the Mufti, uh, Jamali, if I'm pronouncing this right, right, succeeded in persuading Selim to abandon his diabolical project. Again, Sultan Ibrahim was anxious to carry it into effect in the year 1646. So they hadn't completely given up on the idea. The chief of the hierarchy again refused to sanction the cruelty. So credit where credit's due, um, at least the, the religious leaders of the time um, intervened and stopped it. Um, it would have been a horrendous bloodbath had it gone ahead. Any thoughts on that one? Well, you see, you have to think politics again. Mm. Why didn't they totally exterminate the Christians? You can say, well, maybe people had a little bit of uh, conscience. But maybe they didn't want to do it because the whole West will wake up and they will totally destroy them. Absolutely, so, yeah. Uh, you have to think of it uh, both ways. Yeah. Yeah, if you had uh, the combined efforts of of Russia and France and uh, Germany and so on, they, they would have wiped them out, you know. Um, exactly, definitely. so it was not wise. It's not because they were kind, it's because they were yeah. smart. Yeah, but it, yeah, but they did calculate it, you know. It wasn't, it wasn't out of any sympathy. 
as you said. Yes. Um, so although the Grand Mufti might have found it impossible to convince the Sultan of the injustice of his proposed measure, he gave an economic argument against it. He showed Ibrahim that a very large part of the revenues of the empire were paid by the Christian population and they were the most docile taxpayers. So exactly what you're saying um, there. Uh, Murad III really desired to convert all the churches in his empire into mosques. And in 1595, when the news of the sack of Patras reached Constantinople, the extermination of the Christians was discussed in the divan, but the result was confined to the publication of an order for the expulsion, expulsion of all unmarried Greeks from Constantinople within three days. Um, now, there is also a mention of the conquest of, I think you pronounce it, Mytilene. Um, it brought ruin on the Greek inhabitants of the island. One third were sold into slavery in order to raise money to reward the Ottoman troops. One third were transported to Constantinople and one third consisting of the lowest order of the townsmen, the poorest class of cultivators were left to till the soil and collect the abundant harvests of the vineyards and olive groves. So really horrendous stuff really there, isn't it? Yes, let me tell you that uh, the Muslims of today, when you ask them about the jizya, they will tell you, you will only pay 1% or 2%, and this is so that you don't go to war with us, and this is because we are keeping you safe. Well, this is just to lure you in. Yes, you will pay 2% at first, then it will grow to 50 and 60% at last. Yeah. So this is just a scam. Don't, don't fall for it. Yeah. Um, just another example of the cruelty, uh, this is uh, to do with the siege of Fama Gosta. On the 1st of August 1571, the Venetian Bragadino surrendered his garrison in line with the stipulations, stipulations in the treaty. Despite his gallant conduct, he and the officers were accompanied, who accompanied him to the vizier's tent were treacherously seized. Most were instantly murdered, but the governor was reserved for a lingering death by the most excruciating tortures for 10 days. Mustafa Pasha ordered Bragadino to be publicly flayed alive on Friday, the day set apart by the Mohammedans for their public prayers to God. The skin was cut from the upper half of his body before he expired. 300 Venetians were massacred at the same time. Every article of the capit capitulation was violated, and even the troops on ship on shipboard were compelled to disembark and were reduced to slavery. So, you know, even for the cruelty of the times, this was horrendous stuff. And it reminded me of what the Sasanians did to a Roman emperor whose name escapes me, who was captured by them during a battle at Odessa. Um, this would be um, a few centuries before Islam. So it's, it seems like they have retained some of that early cruelty from the time of the Sasanians right through um, a thousand years later. It's amazing. You know, this idea of flaying, um, flaying people like that is, is horrible. Any thoughts on that? I think this cruelty comes more from um, Central Asia, more from... Uh like the Huns and these people, not more Sasanian. The Sasanians, yes, they were brutal, but the Turks, they they were called the Guk Turks, and they came from these places. And way before Islam, they used to be called like uh, people who eat human. They used to eat human cannibals and stuff. They were very, yeah. very cruel beyond belief because they didn't have a country. They kept going and plundering places than going to other places they were not really a civilization like iran or rome so these people they were another level of yeah. cruelty yeah and i think that sort of level of cruelty just disseminated right through the ethos of all the, the muslim lands even yes, combine that with islam then you have the ottomans <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's it it's like the worst of the worst combined together you know Yes. Uh, but, you know, we've shared some really horrible examples, but that isn't even the worst. You know, there's a lot worse to come. So, um, you know, it, 
for Halloween, of course, we are going to give you plenty of scares. So um, <laughs> you may be sleeping with your light on tonight. Um, we're going to um, play a video. Um, it's creepy things that uh, were done by the uh, Ottomans. And uh, let's just hopefully it all works fine. This is the first, I think. I don't know if we've I've shared a video like this before. Maybe I have. I can't remember. But uh, let's see how it works. Uh, and if there's any problems, just let me know. Creepy things that were normal in Ottoman, in the Ottoman Empire. Here we go. Empire dominated Southeastern Europe, Turkey, and the Middle East for 400 years, from the time of their establishment to the peak of their power in the 17th and 18th centuries. However, underneath such magnificence was the foundation made of dark and messed up practices that would besmirch their legacy and eventually resulted in their fall. Welcome to Nutty History, and today let's find out what creepy things were normal in the Ottoman Empire. We all fight, prank, and tease our siblings. The reason behind such attention seeking is the unconditional love we have for our brothers and sisters. Despite giving each other a hard time, siblings are also the first to stand up for their siblings when in need. Even though some horrible things happen as an exception, such as fratricide, at least we can be content knowing that we don't have it as bad as the Ottoman Empire. Unlike their tradition, people today don't grow up preparing to kill all of their brothers before their brothers can kill them. In the early generations of the Ottoman Empire, the practice of primogeniture wasn't strictly followed. Primogeniture was or is the practice of a firstborn legitimate child, preferably male, inheriting the belongings of his father after his passing. The Ottoman Empire did things differently back then. When Mehmed, the conqueror, besieged Constantinople, his own uncle was fighting against him from the walls. In typical Ottoman fashion, Mehmed dealt with his uncle. He offered no mercy after he took the throne, and he had a message for future generations of Ottomans. He began rounding up all of his male relatives and executing them. His ruthlessness didn't even have an exception for his younger brother, who was just an infant in the crib. Mehmed had him asphyxiated without batting an eye. Once Mehmet was done disposing all his possible competitors for the throne, he proclaimed, And to whomsoever of my sons the sultanate shall pass, it is fitting that for the order of the world he shall kill his brothers. Most of the Alema allowed this, so let them act on this. Thus began a series of generational civil wars where every sultan successor of the Ottoman Empire had to soak their hands in their own brothers, cousins, and uncles' blood to secure the throne for themselves. It is said that another Mehmed, Mehmed III, was so heartbroken that he tore his beard off in agony as his younger brother begged for mercy and swore again and again to never raise a weapon against him. Yet bound by the family tradition, Mehmed III turned away without speaking a word, and the loyalists killed the young boy along with the rest of the 18 brothers of Mehmed III. Bodies of all 19 siblings were thrown out on the streets of Istanbul, and it is said that the whole city cried for their souls that night. Now, mind you, the murders would not just stop after the Sultan would secure the throne. The hunt for all of the royal family's relatives would be carried on relentlessly. Even Suleiman the Magnificent's hands were not clean as he had his son asphyxiated on the streets with a bowstring just because his popularity had become a matter of paranoia for the most acclaimed Sultan of the Ottomans. However, when Ahmed, first of his name, abruptly died in 1617, a general agreement was struck between the relatives and the family he left behind. Instead of drenching the streets of Istanbul with royal blood this time, the clergy quietly established the practice of primogeniture and announced his younger brother Mustafa I as the new emperor because Ahmed's sons were too young to rule. Mustafa himself was spared by his brother Ahmed I as the 12-year-old and 13-year-old brothers were too close to order death toward one another. Since then, the policy of killing relative changed to incarcerating them. Potential heirs to the throne would be confined to the top copy palace. In Istanbul, these special apartments would be referred to as the capes. However, in English, this translates to the cages. A prince of the Ottoman Empire would have to possibly spend his whole life in prison in the cave while being monitored day and night by guards. These princes were given all sorts of luxury and they were able to live a lavish lifestyle fit for royal kin but the restrictions of house arrest were enforced strictly. This caused many of the princes to go mad from boredom or become heavily debauched. When a new sultan would be taken to the gate of felicity to receive the allegiance of the viziers, 
that very well would be the first time for him to be outside in decades. Not an ideal preparation for a man who was about to become the ruler, was it? And even though the ritualistic civil wars were put to an end, the royal relatives would still live their lives in constant fear of losing their heads at any second. Oh, I'm just going to come back to you. What do you make of that? <laughs> well, you could just ask one question. If you asphyxiate your own son for any reason, this means that you have serious mental issues. Yeah. So this was almost normal in the Ottoman times. And also some of the things uh, not mentioned in the video. What they did with the slaves, they used to castrate them. And the way they did it was uh, horrific. They would just yeah. crush it with their hand. Yeah. So this is something that... Uh, I don't know. I, I can't imagine such stuff. Yeah. But that level of cru yeah. that level of cruelty would have permeated the entire society and screwed up everyone's minds. So it's uh, like culturally destructive. Really, it just destroys the common bonds of, of fraternity and, and love and things like that. You know, it's it's how, how does an empire last with those sort of values at the core? Um, the other thing that's, that struck me was there was a princess in Saudi Arabia who was under house arrest. Do you know about her? I think so, yes, but I didn't look into the details. Yeah, just I know that she had been under house arrest under the Saudi uh, royal family and, you know, literally exactly like a few centuries ago. So this insanity, to use Kafir Linda's word there, is still there it's you know the potential for that is still very much there it's a bar barbaric um sort of um way of life um and really unfortunate because even the the sultans themselves like they were torn themselves they knew that what they were doing is wrong like the guy that was tearing his own beard as he as he killed some of his family you know it's just you know they, they're, they're they still had a human conscience but the system set them up to do these horrible things, you know, and uh, they, they weren't strong enough to to go against it. And uh, I suppose the the fact that you had thousands of brainwashed janissaries as well, ready to attack you if you if you go against the system wouldn't have helped, you know. Um, so let's go. Let's go back. Um, I'll just continue from there. Oye, ¿qué haces? ¿Qué quieren? Now, we know you might be feeling pity for those young princes and other relatives which sultans of the Ottoman Empire incarcerated for the simple crime of being related to them. However, do not curse the sultan for being a heartless monarch, as their life was no better. It might come as a shock to you, but being a sultan of the Ottoman Empire meant next to no freedom. Life in top copy was suffocating, no matter if you were a sultan or his potential heir. According to the clergy and viziers, a sultan must have the wisdom of speaking only when necessary to convey the core message. The quieter a sultan would be, the wiser and more regal he might appear. But the truth of the matter was that clergy, eunuchs, and viziers like sultans to stay quiet so they could make his decisions for him. A particular sign language was developed for the sultans to convey their needs and decisions, therefore having sultans spending most of their days in utter silence. The palace was filled with viziers, courtiers, eunuchs, and concubines who were hungry for gossip. They would smother the sultan in an attempt to gather more power in their favor. Ahmed III was so exasperated that he had to occasionally force pages and orderlies out of his room so he could have a private moment to put his pants on. Even then, the population in his private chamber would be about half a dozen people, including the sword bearers who were tasked with throwing extra people out for him. A sultan had many struggles. This included the internal tug of war between factions and personnel, creepy quiet halls of a huge palace, bottling up the anxiety, depression, paranoia, and the guilt of imprisoning and killing your own kin. Did we mention they had to keep their food hole shut for the majority of the day? No wonder a lot of them became insane or gravely ill in such an intoxicating atmosphere.
One of the most famous elements of the Ottoman Empire was the harem. In the early generations of the Ottoman Empire, royal marriages were coveted for forging alliances, rendering them mere diplomatic negotiations and nothing more. However, Ottomans soon realized that concubines were easier to maintain, and thus harems emerged as the keep for the Sultan's concubines. Interestingly, the harem was managed by the Sultan's mother. Technically, the harem was a women's only place in the royal Ottoman home. Men were not allowed to enter the harem except the bedroom to spend the night with one of the wives or concubines. The mother would also act as the procurer of fine lays for her son and make sure he would not spend too much time with one wife or concubine so that none of the women could influence the sultan too much and become powerful on her own. Also, after bearing a son, a concubine was forbidden from sleeping with the sultan again, you know, so others could have their shot. Between the years 1533 and 1656, the harem gained too much control and influence over the royal court and practically ran the empire from behind their screens and curtains. This period of 130 years is now known as the Sultanate of Women. Any number of concubines were allowed in the palace at one time, and all of the sons born from a slave concubine were considered legitimate if the Sultan wished for it. However, to earn the right to sleep with the Sultan, a concubine had to get clearance from the Sultan's mother. When Murad III spent too much time with his favorite wife, Safiye, his mother, Sabanyu Sultan, convinced him to sleep with other women in the harem, and his sister even presented him with more concubines. In 2014, yes. We'll come back to that. <laughs> well, what do you make of that, uh, Murad? Well, you see... <clears throat> Uh, I remember that a lot of uh, of the Ottomans also were homosexual because if your mother is choosing who you sleep with and who is the wife, then then you are making big problems in uh, in the head of this guy. Yeah, yeah. So it was all very toxic. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. This it's, um, it's almost incestuous that whole thing, you know. Um, yes. It kind of. It reminded me very much of uh, the talk that you you gave recently about the issue of pornography in the Middle East and and how it can lead to psychological problems. I can imagine if someone is so emotionally disconnected that they're sleeping with hundreds of women in the harem that that cannot be good for their mental well being in the long run. Yes, it turns you into a psychopath. I uh, I've seen people like this and I've witnessed this because if um, I think the person shouldn't have more than one lover. If he does, then his energy is all over the place and he doesn't know who he is anymore. And this is uh, deeply a problem. There is a question here I just want to answer. It's a little bit off topic, but I don't, yeah. don't want to lose it. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> this guy called uh, Kane, I think. He says, hi, Murad. It's Kane from Ireland. Just wondering what's your opinion on Christian Prince? I love his aggressive content, but apparently he's an Israeli agent. Curious to what do you think of him as an Arab? Well, I think he's doing a great job, and he knows his content very well. The only difference between me and him is that I just look at the history of Islam. I'm not really interested in making people leave Islam or debating with any Muslims or sheikhs. This is not something that I'm interested in. And why do you say that he is an Israeli agent? I don't know. I get this actually a lot. If uh, if I side with Israel in the Palestinian issue or something. Yeah. But uh, no, I think he is a, a great guy. No problem. Yeah, it's, it's a bit unfair that the moment you show any sympathy towards Israel at all, people assume that you're working for... Mossad or something, and it's it's very unfair, you know. It's uh, yes, that you know, you're a shill. <laughs> yeah. But you know, what's the alternative? Um, it, you know, exactly. You you have the Palestinians versus the Israelis. Okay, it's very difficult to be completely one hundred percent neutral, you know. Um, but um, in any case, let's go back. Um, have you heard of the Hunger Games? Uh, in Ottoman times. No, actually, in, no. there's a, 
uh, there's a movie that was out of a number of years ago. Maybe you haven't seen it. No, no, no. But but the Ottomans had the, their own form of the Hunger Games, as we'll see next. Um, it's a basically a, a case of uh, run for your life. So let's uh, let's go on to that oh. one. Ottomans were also known for their fierce justice. Well, calling the justice would be downplaying the situation. Let's just say their punishment system liked to distribute beheadings. The first court of Topkapi Palace featured two pillars on which executioners would hang the severed heads. The pillars were also accompanied by a fountain so the executioners could clean themselves after the beheadings. During the palace surge, mounds of tongues might be piled up in the first court like seasonal decorations, while a special cannon fired every time a body was thrown into the sea. One might assume Ottomans hired a whole corps of executioners for executing because it was such a laborious job, you know, multiple death sentences and all. Yeah, that wasn't the case, though. Apparently, sultans and viziers found the gardeners of the royal palace qualified enough for the job. Seriously? Did they think clipping branches and clipping necks were the same thing? In the early days of the empire, the sultan's officials prided themselves on their obedience to his whims, and it was customary for them to face execution with quiet grace. Also, it was forbidden to spill the blood of royalty and high-ranking officials, so they had to be asphyxiated instead. That is why head gardeners were chosen for executioner duties, not because of their troweling skills, but based on how huge and muscular they were. While most viziers accepted their punishment with grace and dignity, that was not always the case. During the late 18th century, viziers were granted a second chance if they could literally escape the punishment. Yes, the sultans turned the officer's execution into a sport. Hunger Games, anyone? The official would be summoned to a meeting with the head gardener, and after exchanging greetings, the vizier would be handed a cup of ice sherbet. If it was white, the sultan had granted him a reprieve. But if it was red, he was to be executed. As soon as the vizier saw the red sherbet, he would start sprinting towards the exit. The goal was to make his way to the fish market gate before the head gardener could catch him. The path? Well, it wasn't short, and it wasn't easy. The vizier would have to make his way through the palace gardens, find his way between shady cypress trees and rows of tulips, run across the grated harem windows where women would watch in amusement as vizier would dash towards the gate for his life. If the vizier made it, his life would be pardoned, reducing his sentence to exile. If the gardener caught him, well... Usually, the facade was nothing more than a source of entertainment for the sultan. The rest of the palace viziers were frail, old, or middle-aged men. Some were obviously out of shape to outrun a much fitter and stronger head gardener. Still, interestingly, there were a few winners. Asi Salipasha was the last vizier to face the death race and survive. He was widely congratulated by the sultan and the rest of the attendees, and later he became a provincial governor. One of the most notorious We'll just come back to that in a moment. Uh, what did you make of that, Murat? Uh, it is new stuff for me, actually. I didn't know about it. Um, of course, very brutal. And I don't know. <laughs> I, would certainly, I don't if know I, what more to say. <laughs> if I was a vizier, I'd be training for uh, running the whole time. I'd be practicing my sprints. <laughs> But uh, it's absolutely crazy. Um, I, I was just thinking of that guy that escaped and he was given governorship. Um, you, you'd imagine he wouldn't be having to um, be too appreciative of that after after the uh, the sultan tried to have him killed, you know. But uh, of course. crazy, crazy. Okay. There is a question here, uh, very important, yeah. because a lot of people ask it. They say, is there a connection between Ottoman and Osman? It is the exact same name. I don't know why in English they say Ottoman. They should say Othmans. It's the exact same name. Okay, yeah. See the question there, yeah. Okay, good question. Um, let's go back. Um, a tiny bit left. Here we go. Known as blood tax among Europeans. Now, this blood tax was a collection of 20% of children ages between 12 to 14 from every Christian city, village, or country under the rule of the Ottomans. These kids would be circumcised and forcefully converted to Islam. 
and most of them would enroll in the Janissary Corps. The Janissary Corps was an elite infantry unit of the Ottomans who were tasked to guard the Sultan and his palace. This was the first modern standing army in Europe. Ottoman officials would visit the Christian villages and summon all the boys to check their names against the baptismal records from the local church. The kids would then be ranked based on their strength, agility, and endurance. On average, they took one boy from every 40 households. These boys, now deemed slaves, would be grouped and taken to Istanbul. The Ottomans didn't care if the weaker ones dropped dead on their march to Istanbul. The Ottomans also kept a detailed description of these young slaves so they could be tracked down in case they successfully managed to escape. In Istanbul, further training and conditioning awaited, turning these kids into faithful Muslims and loyal soldiers before they joined the Janissary. The most handsome and intelligent ones found their place in the imperial elite by the side of the Sultan. As horrible and devastating as taming and abducting Christians was, Ottomans had one rule about it. It was forbidden to take a family soul child or children of men who had already served in the Ottoman military. Orphans and Hungarians were off limits due to trust issues. So what do you think? Were Ottomans that great history as history sometimes portrays them or not? Tell us in the comments. Well, I would like to ask this question to uh, BBC and to DW and all these liberal leftist uh, media. And I tell them, why do you shove the Ottomans down our throat in Arabic and in English all the time? What's your problem? Why are you fetishizing the Ottomans every day? Karen, thanks for the uh, super chat. Yeah, Very thank much. you so much, Karen. So as I'm saying, what's what's going on here? What's the agenda? Why do they keep uh, talking about the Ottomans? And even today about the president of Turkey, they they seem to really love him. They want to get yeah. him in Europe, in the EU. So Yeah, I don't understand it. Yeah. Like, the thing is, um, between the EU and Russia, they could bring about a huge amount of change in Turkey and make things a lot be better and more moderate and so on. But instead, they, the, the EU s it seems to prefer fighting with Russia than actually taking on Turkey. It's, it's bizarre logic, like. Exactly. So it, it, sometimes the EU are forming an alliance with Turkey against Russia, or sometimes Turkey is forming an alliance with Russia against the EU. It doesn't make sense to me. But, um, yeah, so that's it. Um, a lot of cruel stuff went on during Ottoman times. Um, you know, it's we've only probably scratched the surface this evening. I'm sure there was a lot more of things. Um, I'm not sorry to see the back of the Ottoman era. Um, I think it's probably um, worth appreciating, having looked at that history, why the Hungarians are not so willing to open up their borders to foreigners or immigrants you know the the us and and the uk tend to tut tut at them and say you know you're being closed-minded you're being insular you know you should take your fair share of immigrants but considering the history behind all of that you can understand why they're they're hesitant to do that any thoughts on that yeah i think the president of hungary is one of the real men or rare today Today, if you say, I want a real man, then you will be ridiculed. They will say, what's going on? You're a racist, you're a bigot, just saying this word. But yeah. of course, I say what I feel, and this is a real man, and he has some crusader blood in him. <laughs> <laughs> I can yeah. feel that. So of course, he's making the right decision. Because yeah. if you look at it, Turkey and Syria, they are sending the worst people intentionally and um of course there is a conspiracy behind this but i will not get into it yeah. but why are they sending the worst people so that they yeah. destabilize the area you see absolutely it's politics it's uh that's using people as as um weapons essentially yeah um, let's say now i want to go to usa they will not take me but if yeah. i'm a terrorist they will take me because they there is someone above me, if I'm a terrorist, who is working with another organization and making everything easy for me to go there. Yeah, yeah. 
Like if you take um, the US situation, I'm sorry to bring in US politics, but there's a certain parallel. Um, when the Democrats took over, they seemed to just allow an awful lot of illegal immigrants to swamp the country. I think it's like something like a million or so in the past year, but they've come up with this crazy policy about two days ago that they are going to award um, $450,000 per person as a, an apology for um, all the hardship they've experienced since coming to America. And a million, a million dollars for a family. Um, so going to, they've already paid out, uh, I think it's a billion billion dollars so far. So this isn't just hypothetical. They've actually paid us. These are for now. These are for immigrants who've entered the U.S. illegally. We're not talking about legal, yes. illegally. Yes. You know, so they're breaking the law and they're rewarding them. And, um, and where and how do you pay them? Do you pay them from your own pocket? No problem. No, they are paying them from the U.S. tax dollar payers. From their pockets, and you know who who these these people will be voting for in the next election. Of it'll course, be the, it'll be the Democrats. So this is pure <laughs> politics. Um, but anyway, we're kind of. I don't want to. I don't want to um, get uh, our audience annoyed and say we're we're being biased and so on. Um, and this isn't this isn't about uh, race per se. This is about the 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 the. the projection of power use, using the plight of immigrants as as a tool of of um foreign policy so like i'm full of sympathy for anyone who has to immigrate and so on that's not the issue and there are legal ways of going about it as well but I, we're talk, what we're, we're talking here about is the exploitation of immigrants through by governments you know it's a different issue um but anyway um any other uh points you'd, you'd like to make put, uh, yeah I, I think if people want to ask uh, a few questions before you wrap up no problem yeah yeah so a couple of minutes now if you want to take um some questions and please if you can just speak in english just out of um respect for other people who who speak english um unless it's a an understandable language that maybe let's say uh, let's see any any questions. Hello to Dahi there, Ifikrak. Um, he says, "Great to hear Murad again. It's good <laughs> to see you, sir." Yeah. Now um, I think there's a question here. Have you seen the Ottoman miniature explicit art? I haven't. No. Do you know anything about that? No. no. Yeah. Um, I, I'm guessing at the name. Would are you from Turkey by any chance? With a name like that, it looks Turkish. Uh, and a question there. Then, what is the meaning of the word Turkey? I don't know. I, <laughs> no <idea. didn't> look <laughs> I haven't looked at it, but um, I think we'll probably stop it at that point there. I um, hope you enjoyed the uh, the show today. Um, we've looked at a lot of the, the horrible histories of uh, the Ottoman times, but um, I suppose to balance things up, just to finish, it, I'm sure there, it wasn't all bad. Um, I'm sure there were some positives. I can't think of what the positives were this minute, but if you can think of any positive during that era, what have the Ottomans ever done for us? I'm sure that they've, they've brought some good. Um, is it the couch? Would they have brought the couch, the divan? Um, that's about all I can think of. But uh, if you think that they have brought any positives, uh, do please uh, balance remember, things up and leave a remember comment. Remember that a lot of things they got from India, and now we think it's Arabic. So what the Indians give to the world is much bigger than you think. So uh, I wouldn't jump quickly before looking into it yeah. and seeing. There is a, just a question from Karen here. Yeah. She says, would you agree that Erdogan is working to re-establish the caliphate? Of course. But the, yeah. the thing is, it's not easy. Yeah. It's not easy because there is another alliance between Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Emirates. And these three people, they're against Turkey. So yeah. um, 
if you want to make a caliphate, you got to have allies that agree with you. And uh, there are still a lot of problems for him to establish a caliphate. Yeah. But does he wish? Of course. Is he working on it? Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be very difficult considering the divisions that are there. And I think what has has probably made it even more difficult is the fact that um, Israel has formed alliances with different countries there recently, I think under uh, Trump's influence. And so that would have made it even more difficult for Turkey to to get the, the level of alliances that it would need. Exactly. Uh, um, and another one there from Karen, I would love to see a program which features all of India's accomplishments. That would be interesting actually, I can certainly say that Mathematics would be high on the list of things that we could talk about on that score, and probably Bala would be the man to, I was, to talk uh, about I was that. I just going to say the exact same thing. The Indian guru is the one who, who should educate <laughs> us on yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. But I know that ch chess also comes from uh, India, and they call it in Arabic the same exact word, shataranj, yeah. and uh, it's, it's actually Indian. It's not medieval and it's not Arabic. Yeah, snakes and ladders is another one, which, which uh, demonstrates the the uh, karma at work. Mm. Yeah, going up the ladder and down the snake and so on. Um, all right, that's great. To, oh, last sorry. thing, just last thing. The the Arabic. There is an Arabic story very famous called Kalila wa Dimna. It's about animal stalking, and they say this is one of the most important achievements of the Arab literature. No, it's originally from India, and then it went to Iran, and then it went to the Arabic. And it's very, like, it's very easy to believe because the idea of animal stalking and stuff is always Indian, not uh, Arabic. So uh, that I, also, it's Indian. I would add a thousand and one nights came from India yes. originally as well. That's another one. There yeah. is a little bit of debate. It, it might be Syriac in original. So oh, okay. A little bit debate there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, listen, Murad, it's been a pleasure as always. Uh, great to see you again, and uh, we must do this again. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. I hope you found it of interest and of benefit, and uh, enjoy your Halloween, trick-or-treat and all that, and see you all very soon. Bye-bye.